my name is Rebecca Anonchong, and I'm a tech entrepreneur. So I also happen to be a woman, an African woman, a black woman. And when you put all that together with a tech entrepreneur, it's unusual. So imagine 20 years ago when I started my company, AppStack. It was, I was a unicorn. Nobody looked like me. And so I often get asked, everybody, you know, it's like, so how do you manage? I mean, how did you overcome the challenges of your blackness and your Africanness and your womanness in addition to the challenges of being an entrepreneur? And I could have answered, you know, I'm just smarter than the others. Or I just work so hard and so much harder than anybody else. Or, no, 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 I just have more ingenuity. I'm more innovative. But the truth is, most entrepreneurs work super hard. Most of them are super smart. And most of them are really innovative. So why, what was the difference? What made me be able to overcome challenges that seemingly are, and nobody can overcome, right? So you're like Africa tech entrepreneur, is like, it's impossible, you know? The, the technology become, belongs to Silicon Valley. And so the answer really isn't in the fact that I was better than anybody else, but that my experiences and my life prepared me for the challenges that I was to face as a technology entrepreneur. So I was born and raised in Cameroon, and yay. <laughs> And I, I really, you know, I had a kind of privy, privileged life in Cameroon. I went to one of those very strict Jesuit schools, one of the best in the country. Um, my dad was a famous guy. And so when I went around the name Anonshong, it meant something. And then I had a change in life. I moved to the US in my mid-teens. And I got there, I was a nobody. Not only was I a nobody, but I was a poor nobody going to a public school in a horrible neighborhood. And so you can just imagine that transition. But the hardest part is that I actually had to work. <laughs> so this isn't the kind of work for pocket money. This is like real work. Like you have to work and bring money back because there are household expenses that we needed to meet. And so I found this job selling newspaper subscriptions door to door. Now, I'm not gonna age myself way too much, but in those days, newspapers, you couldn't get digital form. They were only kept in paper. And so I was able to go, and these were, so they would take the teams of people and put them in vans and then drop us in neighborhoods. And then we would go door to door, knock on doors and sell newspaper subscriptions. And if you didn't sell the, a subscription, you didn't get paid. So there was no minimum wage. It was just like, you sell, good. You don't sell, too bad for you. And so I happened to be the only black person on the team. But just some of you that moved when you were a little older, you didn't realize you were black until you moved, <laughs> right? So I never really thought about that. And so I was oblivious to the fact that I was black. And it just happened that the neighborhoods that they would drop us in were what my manager called Archie Bunkers. So nobody re re remembers who Archie Bunker is, but Archie Bunker was a character in a TV show called All the Family, All My Family or something like that in the 70s. And it was maybe what MAGA would be today, right? So rural, white, male, racist, um, but, so why would they drop us in these Archie Bunker neighborhoods? And the manager explained that in those neighborhoods, P 
people would buy. Because, and I'm like, well, why wouldn't we go to a more affluent neighborhood? And they're like, they are already subscribed. So we would go drop, we would get dropped off. And the first few times, I would get dropped off in the same neighborhoods as the other teammates. And I would come back to the van a, a couple hours later, and I'm like, nobody was home. And I'm like, but the others, they would come back and they had sales. You know, they had just a sign of paper saying that they were, there was a subscription. And how did they manage to make sales when nobody was home? And it took me a little bit to understand, but I finally got that they were actually home, but they weren't opening the door. So I was like, okay, so I have to find a strategy. And I figured out that if I had found a way for them to open the door without them seeing that I was this black chick with an accent, because I had an accent back then, that I would not have a better opportunity to sell. So we had these, the newspapers, we had actual samples of the papers with us. And so I figured out that I ring the doorbell and that I would put the newspaper in front of me, just like that, and they actually opened the doors. It was a miracle. So that was a lesson for me, because what I learned from that is that first, we learned that you have to understand your market, right? So the Archie Bunkers, where were our market? It may not have been the easiest market for me. So I had to overcome that. And what did I do? I put the product first. And so by putting the product first, I was able to then get more doors open and more opportunities. So yeah, the doors would open, and I would do my spiel, and by then they were like embarrassed, right? Because like, <laughs> I'm standing in front of them, and so like, some of them would still slam the door, but those who would listen, a lot of times they had objections. They were like, eh, I already get it at work, or there's too much paper, or I don't need it, or, <sighs> and I figured out that these objections and these challenges in selling were the same over and over and over again. And so I actually went home and I wrote down all the challenges and I had responses for every one of them. So that when I went back to them with my smile and my newspaper in front of my face, I would be able to convince them that this was you know, worth their $5 a week. And you would think that, you know, I would have said, oh, well, you know, for my white uh, counterparts, it was so much easier, right? But that wasn't the challenge, right? The challenge was I had to sell, period. And so I was not going to weigh myself down with the slam doors or the unopened doors and, or the unopened opportunities. I was going to focus on the next door and focus on the next opportunity. And yeah, even that opportunity would have some challenges, but I'd found tools and ways of overcoming those challenges. And still, I was not the top salesperson. There was a guy named Michael. You've all met Michael. <laughs> he's blonde, he has blue eyes, he's athletic, he has that Colgate smile. And he has, it just seems like life is just on wheels for Michael. So Michael was our top salesperson. And Michael, I was like, how does he do it? So I decided that I would follow Michael around. And he let me because he was so confident and arrogant that, oh, I'll give you the tips and tools of my trade. And so yeah, I followed Michael around. And indeed, a lot more doors opened for Michael, and a lot, a lot fewer doors slammed in his face, and he did have fewer objections when he did get to speak. And so he made it look really easy. But Michael also did have a technique. He said, you know what, this is the trick. When they open the door, you put the newspaper in their hands. You just stick it in there. That's 90% of it, when they have it in their hands. And so I used those tools later in my own sales. And I could have said, gosh, life is so much easier for Michaels. 
You know, the Michaels have it so much easier. That's not fair. But I'm like, no, 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 no. The lesson I picked from that is learn from the best, right? Learn from it. Don't envy. Learn from it. And, you know, the, the overall theme of this is that I went from this privilege, life of privilege and life of, I mean, so much comfort to hardship and difficulty. But I learned something that would stay with me for the rest of my life. I wasn't more unhappy. I was actually pretty happy, surprisingly, in this new life. So my circumstances changed. But I remained who I was. I remained as strong as I had been. I remained a black woman. I remained an African woman. And I was not less happy than in a different circumstance. And so those, some, those are some of the lessons I learned very, very, very early on. And when I decided to start my company, so fast forward, 1999, it's the dot-com boom. Everybody is starting companies. I'm like, why would I be different? Um, so I started a company called AppStack. I'd been working in finance and tech for about 10 years and decided that, yeah, I was gonna do my startup. You know, everybody was doing startups. There was a, a documentary, startup.com. That's the, the life that we were living in. And so how was I going to build this business and be successful? So I went back and I said, hmm, I have to figure out who my Archie Bunker is. And in this case, my Archie Bunker was multinational companies. So the people that bought the market that I would be best able to sell to because they bought were multinational companies. But okay, so there's this black African chick who says, oh, I'm gonna sell to multinational companies. How do you do that? How do you get, how do you get those Archie Bunkers to open the door? the same way I did years before. I'm not gonna say how many years either. <laughs> the same way I did years before, I put the product first, right? Remember in the newspaper, I stuck in front so they would open the door? So I created this website. Yeah, I coded back then. So I created, it was like pretty horrible website, but so were my competitors. And the website made me look like this big corporation and it was in French and in English, or in English and French. And so, and then I rented an address from some company, fancy address, and I printed business cards and put no title on the card. So I was just Rebecca and Ancha. So I could walk in and be a salesperson. I could walk in and be an engineer. I could be a procurement manager. I could be whoever I needed to be for the circumstance. The important part was getting the product in front. And that helped a lot. I sold. I actually sold, you know, signed lots of contracts. And so I had to hire people. I had to hire lots of people. And I wanted to hire Africans because I was an African. And I knew how difficult it was for Africans. So yeah, I hired lots and lots of Africans. And then we'd go back. And then back in that time, and still to some extent, the way those multinationals bought enterprise software and services was that they would take the resume, they would look at the resume and read the resume and say, okay, how much are you charging for this resume? And how much are you charging for this other resume? And so every resume, depending on the level of experience, would have a different price. And I don't know, but still back then, the resumes were like named with like Diallo and Ochefu and Tukam. Somehow they didn't arrive, they didn't build trust with the customer. They're like, mm, these names. Actually, I had one customer tell me that for this price, I expected a white person. So I could stay in angry or I could find a way around it, right? 
And I had the tools for that because I had sold newspaper subscriptions door to door. So I went back to the drawing board and I said, hmm, how can I overcome this? How can I, this is, these are the objections that I'm getting from the customer. How, what are the solutions around for that? And so I, I productize services. I no longer presented resumes. I said, okay, you have this problem. These are the solutions. We have A, B, C. Fixed price, guarantee. If it works, you pay us. If it doesn't work, you don't pay us. They don't look at who is doing it. They don't look at how many people are doing it. And believe it or not, that was so innovative back then. Other companies took that model later, but it was a brand new business model. And the only reason I did it that way is because I didn't want people to know that we were all Africans. And so, Eventually, we started signing more and more and more of these contracts. But still, some of these multinational companies were still challenges for us. You know, we were still hard pressed in some of these, to sell to these, some of these customers. And so I was like, hmm, remember Michael? So I was like, hmm, how can I, how can I learn from Michael? Well, I wasn't exactly going to get my salespeople to go around with their salespeople to customers to see how they close deals. That wasn't gonna work. What was the next best thing? Hire the Michaels. So we brought on the Michaels into the company and their expertise and their abilities and their techniques were part of, of ours. And so again, you don't envy the best, right? You learn from the best and you apply those to your business. Within three years, AppStack had grown so much. Um, we had offices on three continents. We had hired hundreds of employees, generated tens of millions of dollars, and had customers in almost 50 countries. Success. This was the American dream, so to speak. I made the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Trade, trade magazines were talking about our success and our unusual business model. And so we were on the way up. Comfort, privilege, and it was all going away. We almost lost everything when through circumstance, one of our customers decided that they weren't going to pay a multi-million dollar bill. And that hurt us so badly. We had to close down some offices. We had to lay off staff. And we were really just in survival mode. But then I remembered, it's just a change in circumstance. It doesn't change what we've accomplished. It doesn't change AppStack, and I didn't change. What changed was my state of being, my circumstance. And so, yeah, we came to overcome it, and we're celebrating our 20th year. And again, I'm asked, what is it like to be a black woman African entrepreneur. And I say, those are my characteristics, but they don't define me. My experience is what molded me. And those tools that I got from those experiences. And you know what? Michael, the Michaels, they've got nothing on me. Thank you.